Hi, I'm Laura Bullock. I'm the curator of Fear No Art Civic Engagement Histories Currencies, and today I'm here with John Perrot to talk about his work. So John was born in Chicago, and after he attended his undergrad, he went to the Maryland Institute College of Art and also did a resi residency in Skowhegan. His work can be seen in many galleries across the country. And he is exhibited in museums such as the MCA Chicago. He's also been commissioned to do special projects for the Mini Cooper Corporation. Um, he's designed the book cover for H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. And he's also been the subject of a virtual reality TV show, which is pretty cool. So today we're here in front of the painting and let's start talking about the work. The first thing I wanted to ask you is just kind of what inspired you to become an artist? Um, I grew up with a very academic family. My father um, um, ran a research library in DeKalb, Illinois. I was taken to the library every week gr growing up, and that's when I discovered, um, you know, picture books filled with paintings, and that just, my interest kept growing, and I would check out these art books. I didn't really understand them, but I was just drawn to the, the visual imagery and the colors. And so that's kind of where it kind of started from. This love of the of illustrated books and my parents bought me, you know, simple colored pencils and, I, and some paper to kind of, um, you know, occupy me. I was very distracted as, uh, as, a, as a child. And so this was the only way that they could, that I could, focus and be quiet for long periods of time. So what became as a, a way of behavior, you know, <laughs> turned out to be my career, as you could say, you know, and uh, long, lifelong curiosity of the arts, of um, our other artists, and here we are today. <laughs> cool. So I invited you to be a part of the show because I've been a fan of your work for at least 15 years. And it's just incredible for just the colors that you use. I know about kind of your technique and you hand mix all the colors to just the perfect shades. And it's also just really engaging. It really draws you in. But I think it sort of goes beyond that. Like it's almost theatrical in a sense because not only is the viewer just attracted to the work, the work sort of also kind of reaches out and literally engages the viewer into it. So like some examples of that in this installation, this, the title of this work is Chromosexual. It's this whole installation we see behind us. And um, so it's interesting because it's not just painting, although all of the elements include painting, but it also kind of has a sculptural quality, um, these cut out pieces that kind of actually pull out from the wall. So it's almost as if the work is kind of calling out to the viewer to like come in and kind of notice. Um, and then these shapes within the painting, um, they could be many things. Just they could be oranges, they could be celestial bodies. So I just, could you talk a little bit about kind of the maybe theatricality or just what you what the, you see as the relationship with the viewer is or what do you want viewers to get from interacting with your work? Well, I have been in a lot of museum shows. I've been, you know, I, I, I see a lot of artwork and I started recognizing what draws me to certain um, pieces and shows and, and like, what happens when I'm walking in a gallery, if I pause, the average person stops at a painting for three seconds or something. And so I decided earlier in my art making that I wanted it to be more of an installation experience. I love the fact that you can see a work from far away and it draws you toward, towards it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I chose, I did it this way because I really like the fact that you can see it from across the room, but maybe one painting will draw you closer for four, um, 
for further examination. So it's working on two levels. It's working from across the room and it's working for that you can see the other people, the relationship with the other works, but then you can have your moment with the painting up close and intimate. Um, it's called chromosexual because it's all about um, color, basically, and a lot of people are afraid of color. There's, a, it's, it's okay. kind of like, and I feel like I'm sort of educating them on showing colors that they haven't seen together. Afraid of color in what way? What do you mean by that? Well, they're sort of like, you know, it's like, you know, the American, like my parents, grew, I grew up in a very color void um, home. Okay. Camel carpeting, cream couches, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of tan. Maybe it was the 70s, but I think it was my family was like scared to you know go anything other than grayish gray mm -hmm. beige <laughs> you know and then i noticed a lot of other people and a lot of other artists do they kind of like they kind of haven't really developed their palette and so i'm always trying to push myself with my colors mm -hmm. does these colors how would it, these colors look together what happens when two colors are put together they change drastically mm -hmm. it's sort of like a science so it's like kind of like me, like a chemist, coming up with the right concoction to draw you in, to make it friendlier, in, instead of like, oh, those colors are so rough, I can't, you know. Mm -hmm. I made a painting the other day of orange and green that you wouldn't think would, would work, but with a little um, research and testing, it made it into a pleasing piece. So that's why I'm always trying to challenge myself mm -hmm. and push, push the boundaries of color and what we kind of um, are used to seeing and what we are kind of um, seeing something with, that's fresh with our eyes. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like this coral pink with this fluorescent orange and black. You know, why does that look good? You know, and like maybe people haven't even seen it. Like, you know, people who visit the library are going to see this work for the first time. So we really want to give them, you know, some meat and potatoes. An experience. Yes, yes, yes. So I do like, I do try to make it as theatrical. I do think of like the environment mm -hmm. and the intimacy of the work. And I think those two things can, can be brought together mm -hmm. in one piece. Well, you mentioned kind of your family growing up and like just the environment, the beige environment. Yeah. So that kind of brings me to my next question about kind of like narrative in your work. So just by putting, you know, different paintings next to each other, it, it automatically creates some kind of story. I feel like as humans, we're like always trying to make things make sense together. So, but, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, like in terms of, like, is there kind of a, a specific narrative that that you're you kind of want people to get from this? I know you sort of give sort of clues, like each painting, although the whole installation has a title, each painting also has a title that's rooted in a time of day and a location in Los Angeles. So, um, yeah. So I know I kind of would create sort of my own little story, but I'm interested in like, is this, is this like a, is there a personal element or do you want to kind of leave it open or? Oh, the, I, I can elaborate. Mm -hmm. This whole series is based on me living in LA and um, the kind of the, kind of the challenges I face being an artist, making, you know, having the job, but then also having time to be in the studio. And I noticed by going to work every day and parking my car, um, inspiration for paintings would slip in, but it was always the wrong time. It was like when I was like, you know, in a parking lot, I'd get this amazing idea for a painting, or I'd be like, um, you know, at work, you know, um, you know, on a, on a photo set, like kind of trying to make the model look natural. Mm -hmm. And I'd get this, you know, I get this inspiration. And so like, these all are on streets that I have been on 
that I felt something, you know, I felt like my, um, the inspiration slip in. Inspiration can come in at any time for an artist, and mm -hmm. it's, um, usually it's the wrong time. <laughs> it's, it's never, it's never in, the, in the studio when you're painting, although we do, you know, you do get inspired having all your paints there, yeah. but it is usually driving, you know, <laughs> you know, in the grocery store, doing errands, doing, and I started thinking about this and how I could use it in my work like kind of this struggle that the modern artist does have, like putting food on the table and paying his studio rent and paying his apartment rent and all of his bills. Right. But, and, but, Especially during COVID. Yes, exactly. It's just survival of the artist has, has always been difficult. But the rewards of, of having something in your mind and then putting on canvas for others to enjoy, that's such a feeling that I'm very grateful to experience because mm -hmm. not many mm -hmm. people do that. Not mm -hmm. many people have the chance to put their um, ideas and make them physical for other people to enjoy. Right. So, so yeah, whether this one's at my, um, the blues mm -hmm. are basically when I worked at Warner Brothers Studio when I was like driving around in a golf cart at eight o'clock at night trying to get the job done. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, while other things are like, you yeah. know, walking to my car in the morning or coming home from um, a friend's house, mm -hmm. y you know, looking for parking in my neighborhood, you know, or um, just like a, a, a easy day at the beach. So yeah. I kind of travel all um, LA and paint these vignettes for everyone so that they don't have to, you okay. know? Yeah. So the, the, the titles do add a clue yeah. and um, hopefully it will, make, it will make them think that there's beauty in, in the, everybody's daily life. Mm -hmm. You just have to find it. There's also an ominous quality though. Although they're like gorgeous, beautiful paintings and that draw you in, it's like, there's something, just because the forms aren't so, like it's not a typical landscape, you know? And that's another reason I wanted this yeah. work in the show, because it approaches landscape from a different kind of angle. Um, but yeah, like just kind of meditating on these forms, like, like these maybe are oranges, but again, maybe they're suns. Like, and even this kind of shape right here, it looks like a sun, it makes you think of a sunset maybe, or maybe a landscape on fire, but also kind of reminiscent of blinds, like like kind of peering out, like yes. there's just like this mm -hmm. kind of mystery, air of mystery in the work, which, you know, is really interesting. Well, I chose the oranges and the other um, fruit paintings. These are passion fruit, um, because they're sort of like the LA, the LA dream, right? you know, like green lawns, lush gardens, orange tree in the backyard. It's almost like, you know, people, people throughout the decades, people came to LA to reinvent themselves. You know, I'm going to be a star, the lure of Hollywood in the, in the forties and the fifties, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, the hippies in the, in the sixties, you know, leaving the East Coast to the California where it would be more free. Mm -hmm. um, gay men coming out to the West Coast to be, um, to have a better life in San Francisco, but it's not without challenges. Yeah. It's the, the oranges kind of say, look, but don't touch. Yeah. It's, your dream is right there, but there's still a gate mm -hmm. in front of it. You, you know, and I experienced that walking around LA, I would see these gorgeous properties with their orange trees, yet I'd be schlepping it to my next job, mm -hmm. wondering when I was going to achieve a level of success that was comfortable, financially independent, and mm -hmm. just maybe a peace of mind to do my work. But it doesn't work out like that. <laughs> and everybody realizes that when they're in LA, it's not as easy as you would think. The sun, the the, the palm trees are very deceiving. And I love that mm -hmm. dichotomy mm -hmm. of like this lush environment. It's paradise, but then the darker side. Yeah. 
which we have seen in, the, in California in the last six months with the fires, the social unrest. It's not this land of milk and honey. It's a yeah. little bit more complicated than that. And that's what I'm hoping that these paintings allude to. Mm -hmm. There is, there's something to me unsettling about um, the leaves and the, the yeah. and how they're kind of jagged and Serpentine, yes, almost, yeah. almost psychedelic. It's mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. like um, an aggressive movement of you know, that kind of alludes to the instability just a little bit more. Yeah. Like, what am I looking at? You know, why, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it works. I get that when I look at this work. They're and kind of, they kind of mock you. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, we're in the painting. You're <laughs> out there. Yeah, it makes, me think of, it makes me think of that story about the yellow wallpaper almost. Do you remember that yes, story? Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> But just the feeling. Yeah. But um, I'm going to ask you another question about medium, though. Um, so I think of you as a painter. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I think of. John's a painter. Yeah. But you are, you always kind of have, like, you've experimented with sculpture kind of throughout yes. the years. Yeah. So kind of what kind of direction do you see your work taking? Are you, are you going, like, is it, are you always just kind of straddling that line or? I love straddling that yeah. line because I love to give my viewers something fresh to look at. And so I kind of push the, um, oh, she asked me, you asked me to put a couple paintings in the show. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have a great, at how much wall space do I have? Mm -hmm. So I really like to push what um, I'm given sometimes. I wanted to give you like a, I wanted to see how they would look. I'm really interested in the painting when I'm painting them, but mm -hmm. when I have them displayed, I want to push it just a little bit more. And so this whole idea, these paintings are very intimate. You can get lost mm -hmm. in them looking at the leaves, but what would it be like if you arrived in the gallery and you were already in the painting with this, mm -hmm. and then you look it up, you look up and there's a mini painting that you're already in. Right. So it's like you're almost there. It you're, draws you yeah, in. Yeah, it's, it's you're like ex <laughs> yeah, it's like when you see these leaves in relationship to these leaves, I thought that would be really exciting for the viewer to experience both levels. These li these these small oranges and these larger than life oranges suns. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of so I'm always trying to think of interesting ways where a painting show is not a painting show. A painting doesn't have to be on a canvas. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it's, um, I don't know, it's what I really like to do. I mean, I love yeah. making the paintings, but showing them in a creative way is something that I want to push further on in, in the future. And one more interesting element that you've started kind of incorporating as part of your practice is tarot reading. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how you kind of situate that within your practice. I've been um, familiar with tarot for many years. At first, I was interested in the tarot deck. I received my first tarot deck at 16, and I was kind of just looking at all the photos and or all the cards and all the pictures, and was really fascinated. It was a couple years later that I started reading, and recently I've added it to my artistic practice. I host um, nights of tarot reading where I do the reading to guests and I pick an interesting architectural place like um, an Irving Gill um, mid-century house. I would have it in the garden or maybe the Tom of Finland Foundation mm -hmm. where I'd have it in their garden. The people would come, we'd give them a glass of wine, we set it up kind of like a, an art installation mm -hmm. and they would get their cards read by me and um, it just turned out and afterwards it would turn out to be a salon where people talked about their readings and drank more wine and talked about the ideas of the tarot, personal growth, mm -hmm. art, that sort of thing. And it was a great way to educate people not only on the tarot, but the environment that they were um, in, mm -hmm. the history of um, Irving Gill, Tom of Finland, 
you know, location is a, a big part. Again, mm -hmm. always giving the audience something more. It's right. not just a tarot reading, it's an architectural lesson or, you know, a lesson on another famous um, gay artist mm -hmm. to educate them to maybe open their curiosity door. So I love reading tarot. Um, yeah. I think I use it as a tool instead of something that, you know, we try to take the, away the hocus pocus about, of it and kind of use it more as a way of learning more about ourselves and what we want in the future, who we want to be and where we're going. Mm -hmm. Nice. So that's kind of a nice foil, kind of like pondering on the difficulties versus kind of something more aspirational. So you kind of offer both. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, our lives are so complicated and busy, you know, it, I'm always fighting with that, with other people, to find the time to look at art, mm -hmm. you know, to actually mm -hmm. take time out of their busy day. When we read the tarot, a lot of my guests, they're like, I'm so busy, I, you know, I have to do this and this. We're always so busy that we don't even take time uh, to to explore what's going on in our lives. And the tarot does this for an hour. We talk about the cards, where you are going on in your life, and what we can do to help you achieve your goals. We don't really talk about that during the day. We don't talk about that during with our friends. Mm -hmm. Like, hey guys, do you think I, you know, <laughs> how am I doing? You know, yeah. we, we're always going to the next thing or thinking about dinner or ice cream or, you know, <laughs> we're not do, asking the hard questions. And I try to bridge that mm -hmm. with my guests and make it enjoyable through tarot and location. So where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, you can find me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at J Parot, P-A-R-O-T. I also have an Instagram account for my tarot nights, and that's Parot Tarot at Instagram as well. And I'm also on Facebook, just my name. So um, yeah, we're, we hopefully ha will be having uh, more tarot events in, um, the California area. Who knows where we'll be next <laughs> and when during, this time. during yes. this time. I'm always available for a tarot reading, you know, one on one in a garden six feet away. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I asked John to pick a work in the show that spoke to him other than his own work. And so we're in front of William Hogarth's Gin Lane. So John, why, why were you drawn to this work? Um, I love this piece. It just totally, you want to walk by it because it's like an engraving. You know, it's the exact opposite, black and white, you know, very detailed. I almost walked by it, but then it really draw me, drew me in with its unconventional um, composition, the foreground, the diagonals going everywhere, and it's just this great um, depiction of a chaotic event, a chaotic street life, the horrors of gin, the <laughs> horrors of drinking. You know, it's, it's super narrative. It's super, um, you, wanna, you want to walk around in it and explore all the characters. This guy is like dead, you know, rotting away, drinking, but still has the gin cup in his hand. <laughs> She's so drunk that she's letting her baby fall. She's riddled with syphilis sores, you know, which was the prevalent disease in the mm -hmm. day. Apparently, he's trying to tell you if you drink too much gin, you're going to get syphilis, <laughs> which I think that's great. I love this woman who's like, um, you know, everybody's drinking. This woman, this man is so, um, so handicapped, he has mm -hmm. to have another person pour the drink in his mouth. There's a sign that rem rem uh, that um, that mirrors a casket. There's a person mm -hmm. in a casket. <laughs> there's some weird um, duelings on. Some there's uh, some thievery. Some yeah. yeah. He, if it's in this, it's got it. This um, this three thing represents the juniper berries. I think mm -hmm. of this evil liquor gin. Juniper berries are made to make gin. I think mm -hmm. we yeah. discussed it was created in Holland. 
this is a London street. Mm -hmm. I the think the evils of foreign, the evils the foreign of foreign <laughs> alcohol, you know, this is what will happen to you. But like the, the social commentary aside, you've got this wall and this going this way and the stairs going that way and these flagpoles going up there. It's like your eyes really great from the building back to this midsection to the to the foreground. Mm -hmm. It draws you in. It kind of makes you want to explore it. And that's the genius of Hogarth. Mm -hmm. Yes, A plus. <laughs> <laughs>